Okay, we're going to take a look at the game Imperium Romanum II, published by West End Games in 1985, and uh, the designer was Al Nolfi with Nicholas Quain. Now, this is a big game. Big in the sense that it contains a lot of scenarios. And um, we're going to have to look at the game in sections. In a short video, I can't possibly um, show you the game's treasures. All I can say is it's almost like a master's thesis on the Roman Empire. It's uh, quite a piece of work. So let's look at the individual pieces of the game, give you an idea of what it's like. Okay, just to give you an idea of the scope that the game covers, we're going to take a brief look at the scenario booklet. Now the scenarios, there's 33 of them, they range from the Gallic Revolt in 52 BC, that's with Julius Caesar, to Belisarius versus Justinian, uh, which is a hypothetical scenario, in March of 540 AD. So, 52 BC to 540 AD, you're covering a heck of a lot of ground. Now, it's got some of my favorite scenarios in there, too. For example, um, Caesar versus Pompey, 48 BC. The Triumvirs versus the Assassins, 42 BC. Octavian versus Antony and Cleopatra, 30 BC. Plus, you've got scenarios for Diocletian versus Carinus, the collapse of the Tetrarchy, and uh, the sons of Constantine, the primacy of Stilicho. So, you've got a heck of a lot of scenarios in here, and the scenario booklet itself is a mine of information. Now, the scenarios, as the designer uh, has stated, are not necessarily uh, balanced. Balance was not the designer's concern in creating this game. He wanted to show you history, and in this, he certainly has succeeded. So, the scenario book does show us the, the range uh, that this game covers. Now, let's take a look at the map. Okay, for a map designed in 1985, it's uh, pretty nice looking, even by today's standards. Of course, you've got uh, Spain here and um, Gaul most of the Mediterranean. I'm going to swing way over to the right. And the map is actually in two pieces. And I had to use two plastics to actually cover it. So the east portion is this small portion here. A lot of the scenarios you can play just on the one map to the west, especially if you're playing something like the Belgic, uh, Belgian Revolt. But for many of the scenarios, you're going to need the whole map. That's quite colorful, um, quite nice looking. Um, I suppose it's been eclipsed by some of the modern maps we have in games, but still it's uh, quite uh, nice looking. Let's take it, uh, look at some close-ups. Okay, we'll take a look at some terrain that we're all familiar with. Italy. Um, you can see the city there, Rome, the Louis Square symbol. You can see the uh, anchor symbols, which indicate ports. The brown, of course, is mountains. And the light yellow is clear terrain. Now you can see that um, some of the cities have that kind of little arrows radiating from them. This is to show which cities existed in different time periods. It's quite easy to use, but you um, have to keep in mind that this is covering a heck of a lot of history. So some towns don't exist for certain time periods. Now we'll go over and do um, Belgica there, or Gaul. And let's swing way over to the east to give you an idea there. Syria. You see the Arabian Desert. You can see the light blue is the coastline. And of course the uh, blue is the ocean. Cross over to where Constantinople is here. And take a brief look at Macedonia. Just to give you an idea of what the map looks like close up. And there's your terrain and seasonal effects chart uh, printed right onto the map. Your turn record track. Each turn in the game, by the way, uh, represents one month. So this is quite a comprehensive game. Okay, the rule book has 32 pages, but only about 24 are actual rules themselves. You've got your table of contents, of course, and uh, description of the counters, and we'll take a look at the counters very soon. Now, this is kind of fine print rules, so. Um, 
it would be wrong to say that this is an easy game to learn. There's a lot to it. It's not a complicated game, but there there is a lot to it. Um, as you read it, and if you read Roman history, it kind of reinforces everything you've read about the Roman Empire. It's all there. Leaders, ports and sieges, uh, corn supply. There's a map uh, uh, included in the booklet to do planning on. Uh, corn supply, fortifications, plunder, inactive powers, Limitani, uh, fleet conversion, legion reform, overruns, training, pirates and roads, civilized recruit, recruitment, and there's even optional rules. So to say that this is a simple game, uh, it, it would not be true. It, it, this is There's a lot to this game. Also, you've got these charts here that show you which provinces are settled for the period in question. Because there's six different periods. So periods one and two, Cyprus, for example, would have no roads. But uh, in, uh, let's see, period what? Period six, Cyprus uh, would be cultivated. So you have to consult this chart when you're doing your scenario. There's a lot to this game. Uh, Mr. Nofi has done a lot of work. It's really a study on the Roman Empire. Now, if you look at the comments on Board Game Geek, a lot of people that have it, um, even if they don't like it as a game, they all concede that it is a, a magnificent piece of work. That a lot of work has gone into it and is a good study of the Roman Empire. I myself attempted it back in the 80s and uh, kind of gave up on it. Um, it. It was just too complicated for me. And I'm kind of coming back to it now. And um, I'm not even saying I'm going to play it. But I certainly appreciate the work that's gone into it. I think that's why I like the darn thing, why I keep coming back to it. So let's take a look at uh, some of the charts and tables. Now you can guess at the amount of work that's gone into it by uh, just realizing that there's three booklets that come with the game. The rules booklet, which you took a brief look at. The scenario book, which is quite thick by the way, 36 pages. Again, with all these 33 scenarios. And the charts and tables booklet, which is um, a lot of charts in here. So you've got a forage chart, a morale chart, your tax value chart. That's very important in the game, taxation. Siege attrition, siege priority. Um, and these are the mobilization, mobilization charts for the various periods. So this is not a simple game where in uh, 53 BC you just recruit a legion and away you go. Or in uh, 300 AD recruit a legion and away you go. The mobilization, uh, costs, the areas, all that has been factored in as the Roman Empire grew. So it is a study. A uh, variable city chart showing you um, what the cities are worth for the various time periods that they existed. The deity appeal table. The inactive power table. Corn rebellion table. Very important. And uh, the controversial land combat results table. Um, I remember at the time people thought this was a very bloody combat results table. But if you've studied ancient campaigns, you know that um, many of the campaigns were decided in a single battle. For example, uh, Caesar and Pompey. All right, they maneuvered around Dyrrachium and maneuvered around in Greece. But when it came down to the one big battle at Pharsalia, Pompey was defeated and that was pretty well it. After that, it was mopping up operations. So. My rec recollection of playing this game was that you um, did a lot of uh, taxation and building and trying to get your army together and you often uh, collided in one hex for the big battle and that often decided the scenario. I think a lot of people thought that was kind of uh, dull. But, um, well, that's kind of the way ancient campaigns worked. But um, there is a lot to this game. Now let's take a look at the, um, the counters. Okay, there's um, over 800 counters in this game, and I managed to sort the military counters into one tray set, and I put the plunder training time markers into a baggie, um, the fortifications into a baggie, and the supply depot and control markers into bags. So there's various colors um, for the units. That's for each nationality, of course. And uh, let's take a look at the unit types more closely. 
Okay, here's an example of some leader counters. Um, like I said, the game is very much a creature of the 1980s, so the uh, values are quite um, quite basic. On the left is the combat value of the leader and the movement value. Now, um, the counters are kind of basic again by modern standards, but they were fully functional. And there's your fleet counters. As you can see, they can be very powerful. 36-30s. Now on the flip side of the um, fleet counters, you've got your 18-30s. Uh, so um, fleets as they are, are reduced can be flipped to the uh, other side to show the reduced side. That is not the case with legions, as I'll now show you. Okay, legions are a bit different than the fleets. For example, on the left we have there a veteran legion, 24-10, and uh, a 2010 legion, and a 1610 legion. Now, the front always shows you the legion when it's uh, in veteran status. When it's flipped to its other side, it's still a veteran, but it means it's unseasoned. So, these are not step reduction for legions. The flip side shows the unseasoned side, and the front side shows the seasoned side of a legion. Different than the fleets. Okay, and there's a couple of light infantry units, 4-12s. On the left, standard light infantry. And if the unit has a bracketed figure, it means it's a missile light infantry. Okay, cavalry is the same idea. On the left, standard cavalry, 6-16. And on the right, because it's bracketed, means it's missile cavalry. Now there's a host of um, game markers. You can see in there supply markers and wagons for carrying supplies. And standard control markers various colors to show which nationalities are controlling certain towns. And fortifications uh, at various levels. And the pick and shovel would indicate that you're building the fortification. And the flip side would show that the fortification is completed. And you've got plunder and training markers. So the um, units uh, were fairly basic, but uh, they, were, um, they were functional. Now one of the aspects of the game I didn't care for too much was um, the power and the mobilization form. In other words, uh, bookkeeping. Traditionally, um, I think a lot of war gamers don't like bookkeeping too much. It slows down the game. It's not something you like doing. Um, but this game does have bookkeeping to some degree. And uh, fortunately, unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, that's what makes this game such a gem. Uh, the bookkeeping is an essential part of the game because you have to create uh, your armies based on the tax revenues of the provinces. So, um, well, let's face it, that's the Roman Empire. That's the way it worked. And there's very important rules for corn supply, supplying Rome and cities. So supply is an essential part of the game. It's just part parcel of what this game is. It's a detailed simulation of the Roman Empire and to get that level of detail you have to have a certain degree of um, bookkeeping, bookkeeping unfortunately. Okay, because this is just meant to be an introduction to uh, Imperium Romanum 2, I can't possibly get into how the game works. That would take uh, an entire video all by itself. Suffice to say that Imperium Romanum 2 is a detailed study on the history of the Roman Empire. In that sense, I think it's perhaps better than any current game covering the same subject today. In fact, I'm not sure if any game covers the same subject um, today that's in print. There's the GMT series, there's Pax Romana, and Rise of the Roman Republic, but they're a bit more limited than Imperium Romanum II was. I don't think any game has covered uh, the entire history of the Roman Empire like this game uh, has done. So, um, it would be kind of nice to see this one back in print, actually, redone, and uh, but I don't think that's too likely. It's a serious study on the Roman Empire. 
it's, it's a huge investment of time to learn and to play and I think that's why it's sort of out of, a, out of reach of a lot of gamers out there. So that's just my introductory comments on Imperium Romanum 2 from West End Games designed in 1985.